Okay, so today we're going to wrap up the Bellman equation and um, the main concern that I want to present to you today is the problem that uh, we are going to have a policy that depends on a gain times an estimate of state. That's x hat. And in our derivation so far, we've been using x as if it was x hat. So when we found the value associated with the optimal policy, we showed it to be quadratic in x. But in fact, our motor commands, u, are a function of x hat, our common filter estimate of state. So that's not quite right, meaning that our policy depends on both um, x hat and this uh, value function, which we showed to be quadratic in x. So we need to take care of things a little bit with that regard, which we'll do that today. What we're going to see is that the value of the policy is going to become a quadratic function when we consider a commands u to be a function of x hat rather than x, but that it becomes a quadratic function of both x and the difference between x and x hat. So the value function is going to be dependent on x hat. And that's going to be its component of our, our derivation today. The second thing we're going to see is what to do when we have signal dependent noise. So the signal dependent noise condition is going to make it so that our policy, G, is going to depend on the um, signal dependent noises. Basically, the larger the noise there's going to be, the smaller the gains associated with our feedback loop is going to be. And uh, it also makes it so that the uh, the u that we generate is going to depend on the size of this uh, feedback gain k associated with how we're going to estimate the state of the system. So um, the main thing that, that I want to come back to is that in the Bellman equation, what we're doing is we are finding for the last time step the optimum action. Then we're finding the value associated with that policy. And if it's a closed form solution that we have, then we're going to get a function. If it's a game that we're working on, then we're going to get a value for each state. So some nonlinear function of state. Um, then what happens is that in the step after that, we're going to find the optimum action that minimizes the sum of the cost per step plus the value of the state that we're going to go to, assuming that from then on we're going to have the optimum action. So the value function is really the optimum way to the minimum cost that we're going to incur given that we find ourselves at a particular state. That's what the value function refers to. And what the value function computes is iteratively to give you a value associated with a particular state. How good is this state? And of course, really value here is like a cost because the smaller the value, the better, better that, that state is. And why is it better? Because from that state on, if you produce the optimum, co the optimum commands, you're going to have the, the, the minimum uh, accumulated cost, which is that value function. OK? Yep. So do we get a sense of what the Bellman equation is? Right. So I as it's applied to linear dynamical systems, it's only interesting because it becomes a quadratic function of state. The value function becomes a quadratic function. That's, that's really what that is. But so even if it's not quadratic, whatever function it is, as long as we have a representation of it in state space, we can use it. So that's just a mathematically convenient way of representing the value function. In your homework, you didn't have a value function that was quadratic. It was something else. But nevertheless, if you have enough memory space, you can just represent it as it is. So that's, that's fine. Um, with regard to um, today's lecture, we're going to add to it the concept that, well, the value function depends not just on the state, but also depends on your estimate of state. Because you really don't know the state. At any given time x, you, at the, any given time k, you have an estimate of the state, but you don't really have state. So, well, how good is the value of a state if you have an estimate of state x hat? So, we're going to see how to incorporate that into, into our system. OK, so let me start. As a reminder, 
we will begin with our cost per step, alpha. And we write that There we go. Our cost step depends on state x and the uh, input uh, u. So our, um, our policy at time point p will be to minimize this um, alpha at time point p for state x of p. So we find the u that minimizes that state and the value of this policy at time point p is just going to be um, alpha at time point p, x of p, and pi star of x of p. So you just compute the time per step for whatever. This is just a general representation of it for this particular alpha. You could have um, a, 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 a a uh, particular pi. But this is just a general way of writing our, our, uh, our final, um, uh, 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 our, our policy for the final time step. Then our policy for a step behind the final time point is going to be one that minimizes alpha at time point p minus 1 plus the expected value of uh, the value function at time point p, given that we were at p minus 1 and executed action u of p minus 1. And if we find this particular policy, then the value of that policy at time point p minus 1 is going to be equal to um, alpha of p minus 1 at x of p minus 1. And given the policy x of p minus 1 plus the value plus the expected value of producing that, um, producing that action. Yep. OK. So what we saw on Wednesday was that when we produce the optimum policy, then what we get is that u at time point k is equal to some gain times x hat of k. And if we place this uh, a policy inside the value function, then the value function for the optimum policy at x of k is going to be equal to uh, uh, some quadratic function plus some constant. But that was assuming that u is equal to g times x. So in reality, u is not equal to g times x. In reality, u is equal to g times x hat. And so what that's going to cause is that, well, when we put this u as a function of x hat into this equation, we're going to have to show that the value function is still quadratic function and that we can continue using our procedures. So what we're going to see is that if we allow this to be as a function of x hat, then, of course, what we're going to have to know is that well, what is x hat? How does x hat depend on um, things that you know, we can measure? Well, x hat of k, is equal k given k is for a dynamical system that we typically have. b times um, So our typical estimate of what the 
what, what x hat is going to be at time point k is our prior estimate for what it was plus the difference between what we observed and what we predicted times this thing that we call the common gain. So uh, if we have, for example, a system of the following form, x of k plus 1 is equal to a x of k plus b u of k plus epsilon u plus epsilon x and y of k is equal to c uh, let me write it like this h times x of k plus epsilon s plus epsilon y where I'm going to introduce signal dependent noise in both the action and in the sensors so epsilon u is going to be equal to C1, U1, V1, C2, U2, V2, as many as U's that we have. So U is here, U here is a vector, U1, U2 is the component of that vector. So that's how we're going to introduce signal dependent noise. Phi is just some scalar random variable with a mean zero variance one. Epsilon S similarly is going to be another random variable that looks like this. Yeah, so remember when we do signal dependent noise, what we do is that we say, um, we say that the standard deviation of that signal grows as a function of the signal u. Standard deviation of u grows as the expected value of u with a slope that is, is equal to c. So what, we, what, I, what I'm writing there is that if I have a random variable that is of the following form, so if, y, if, if epsilon u is normally distributed with mean that is u and variance that is c squared times u squared, then in standard deviation, standard deviation of epsilon u. And this is the mean of epsilon u. Right? So standard deviation is going to grow linearly c times u with a slope c. So the randomness is in b. Yeah. So the way I wrote it here is that epsilon is a random variable. And you see that its mean is 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 is, uh, is u times phi, which is zero. But its variance is u squared times c squared. So it has a it, it's it it's it's a random variable with mean zero and a variance that grows as the size of the signal, and that variance grows quadratically, which means the standard deviation of it grows linearly. So epsilon, in this case it's a vector that depends on the vector u and the slope of each of the elements of this vector is defined by this variable c and what this means is that the variance of epsilon u, so it looks like this. So I can write um, uh, epsilon u as follows, sum of this matrix ci times the vector u times the uh, uh, random variable phi sub i. And what, what this means is that ci is this matrix that, for example, c1, this is c1, then it's 0 everywhere else. It's all 0. One element is, one element is c1. And then c2 is 0, c2, then 0, 0, 0, everywhere else. And so I've written epsilon u, which is a vector, as a matrix times a vector times a scalar. And what that means is that the variance of epsilon u is going to be equal to the sum 
of CI U U transpose CI transpose. Its mean is zero. Its variance depends on the squared of U. Sure. So, so there's that U1, U2, um, those are the components of U. Yes, yes. Um, and so then C1, C2 are some given yes. parameters. Of yes, yes, yes. Okay. The individual slopes. Right. So signal dependent noise for a vector, you can have independent slope for each component of the vector. And there's no covariance between the elements. So phi1 no, has no covariance with phi2. They're independent. And similarly with x. So you can have signal dependent noise on the things that you measure. And so epsilon s is going to be equal to the sum of this matrix D times um, x uh, times phi i. And so the variance of epsilon s is going to be the sum of d i x x transpose d i transpose. What this is saying is that for this system, the variance of your observation is going to depend on this, which we normally have, the variance of epsilon y. This is your, our usual random variable with variance Qy, sorry, Qy and Qx, the usual um, uh, variances that we have in our state equation and our update equation uh, and our measurement equation. But this has a variance that depends on x, x of, in this case, x of k. So the bigger the state, the bigger the noise is going to be. The bigger u, the b bigger the input that you have, the bigger your uncertainty is going to be on measuring state on estimating state, this variance here. OK, so our problem remains how to incorporate x hat into, the, uh, into, our, into our problem. All right, so what I have is that my x hat of k given k is a times x hat of k given k minus 1 plus k of k, the common, of common gain, times y of k minus, what's my y hat? My y hat is going to be h times x hat of k given k minus 1. Right, the expected value of the observation equation, the expected value of y of k, the y hat, is just the expected value of h times x, because these other terms expected value of y hat is just h times x because the expected value of this is 0 and this is 0. And then my x hat of k plus 1 given k is, is going to be, um, uh, according to that equation, it's going to be, oh, I'm sorry. There's no a here. Um, so my, my uh, prior estimate for the next trial is going to be my, post my posterior from the previous trial, x hat of k given k, times a plus b times u of k, which is my um, uh, input that I've given to the system. So that's, that's how I'm going to move things forward, which um, is going to be equal to a times x hat of k, k minus 1, plus a times k of k, y of k minus h, x hat of k, k minus 1, plus b, u of k. So what I wrote is that my x hat at time point k plus 1, is going to be equal to a times my x hat at time point k plus a times k of k, y of k minus h x hat of k plus 
B u of k. So what I'm calling my prior estimate, this is my prior, right? That's my estimate on trial k. For any trial k, my estimate of state is my prior. So my estimate of state on trial k plus 1 is my estimate of state on trial k plus my correction with the common gain plus the input that I gave on u of k. That's the expected value of my state in time k plus 1. Is that clear? Do you see why? See what I did? If you, didn't, if you don't, just raise your hand. I'll, I'll go over it again. All I've done is use the common gain to estimate state at time point my posterior. Here's my posterior, right? Here's my posterior at time point k. And I say, OK, what's my prior on the next step? My prior on the next step is my posterior from the previous step plus the input that I gave. That becomes my prior in time point k plus 1. So then all I've done is that I've written this equation in terms of this equation, which is this. So this is my estimate of state at time k plus 1 as a function of estimate of state in time point k. How is this different from our previous? No, it's, no, it's the same. It's exactly right, the same. So we haven't, they haven't done anything. No, we haven't done anything. Okay. No, no, we haven't done it. The reason why I, I need to write this is because I'm going to say g times x hat of k. So what is x hat of k? This is what it is. x hat of k is a times x hat of k minus 1, blah, blah, blah. Right. So why is this important? Because the value function, look at the value function. The value function is in terms of x of p given x of p minus 1 and u of p minus 1, right? And you see that x hat also depends on the previous time points. So we just have a way to write what x hat is. All right, so let's begin at the last time point and minimize and find our optimum, uh, optimum command. So time point P. So for time point P, right, so my optimum policy at x of P is one that minimizes that function, which is going to be equal to 0. Right, so that the thing that minimizes x of p, uh, alpha p, is just going to be 0. And the value function for that policy at x of p is going to be equal to x of p transpose t of p x of p. So uh, what's the value function of x of p given that I'm at x of p minus 1, and I've given command u of p minus 1. Why do I need to know this? Why am I writing this? Yeah, because to, go to move to time point p minus 1, I need to know what my value function is for time point p, given that I'm at some other state. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write that out um, uh, to see what that, what, that sh what that shape looks like for the particular dynamics that I have. And I have a x of p minus 1 plus b u of p minus 1 plus epsilon u plus epsilon x transpose times t of um, p times this thing again. All right, so this, this is just repeated here. That's what that is. So what's the expected value of this function? So what's the expected value of this? Well, the expected value of this quadratic equation is the expected value of this transpose expected value. So let's write that down. What's the expected value? It's going to be a x of p minus 1 plus b u of p minus 1. This expected value is 0. This expected value is 0. 
transpose T of P times this. Uh, plus, what I have now is that I have to consider the trace of T of P times the variance of this. Right? So, this variance here, variance of epsilon u, that's our random variable. And I have a variance of epsilon x, the other random variable. So let's begin with the easy one, variance of epsilon x. Let's see, what is that? This is going to be this term here. I'm going to write it out here. So trace of t of p times the variance of this term, this term here. Let's see what that is. Um, so the, you're going to have the trace of t of p times variance of this term, um, epsilon x, which is qx, plus the variance of epsilon u times b, which is going to be um, the sum of b times uh, d sub i, sorry, c sub i, u, um, u of p minus 1, u of p minus 1 transpose, c of i transpose, b transpose. Right, so this is a scalar variable. This is a trace, so that's just a scalar. And so this is going to be equal to the trace of t of p times q of x plus the trace of t of p times this is, is just going to be a scalar variable, which means that I can rewrite this by bringing the u's on the outside, just doing enough, uh, doing a transpose on the scalar, uh, scalar quantity. I'm going to get u of p1 transpose ci transpose b transpose t of p times b ci let me put this times the sum of um, Ci transpose B transpose T of P Ci B U of P minus 1. Yep. And C is, C is a, a symmetric matrix anyway, so its transpose doesn't mean anything. So, OK, so um, I'm going to call this quantity here Cx at time point P. So then my expected value is going to be Ax P minus 1 plus B u of p minus 1 transpose t of p plus u of p minus 1 transpose cx of p 
u of p minus 1 plus the trace of t of p q of x. OK, so all we've done so far is introduce the concept of signal-dependent noise. And when we introduce signal-dependent noise in our, in our equation, then the expected value of the, uh, uh, the value function, the optimum value function here, depends on um, depends on not just, uh, it depends on this, this C of x, which has uh, these noises in it. So you see that if you have signal dependent noise, then the value function is going to depend on your command u scaled by the noises that influence u. So we didn't have that before. So when we don't have signal dependent noise, then the value function doesn't depend on the, these commands, the noises in these commands. Now that when we have it, the expected value the expected value of this, of this function here, it has these epsilon u's in it, where it depends, on, it depends on u. So the big difference between having signal dependent noise and not having signal dependent noise is that having signal dependent noise makes it so that the value function depends on u. OK, all right. So what this means is that when we, put, when we put in what the u is, if it depends on x, x hat, then it's going to change um, our value function. So, OK, uh, so wh what's our next step? So this is the expected value of u. All right, sorry, the expected value of, under the optimum policy. So what we do is that we say um, the optimum policy at x of p, at x of p minus 1 It's going to be the argmin of u of uh, alpha of p minus 1 plus the expected value of v pi star of x of p, given that you are at x of p minus 1 and you did act action u of p minus 1. All right. so. Um, and this is alpha p minus 1 is going to be x of p minus 1 transpose t of p minus 1 x of p minus 1 plus u of p minus 1 t l u of p minus 1 plus this expected value is, is over there. What's so funny? It just keeps going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we're going to simplify it. That's what, what's nice. So we're going to write it as a, um, um, uh, as a quadratic function of uh, x and u. So this is x of p minus 1 transpose times t of p minus 1 plus I have an um, so if you look at this, I have x of p minus 1, x of p minus 1, a times t. So this is a times t of p 
times A. Uh, that's all I have. Times X of P minus 1. Right? So T P minus 1 plus A of T, T of P. Yep, okay, that's what I have. All right. So now I can write it as a quadratic function of U, U of P minus 1 transpose. I get C of X plus, um, I have u times b times t here. So b times t of p So I've taken care of all the squared u's and x's, and now I get one, one of the interaction terms, 2 times um, uh, let's do the u. So let's do 2 times um, u of p minus 1t times bt, t of p times a x of p minus 1 and plus the trace of tpqx. So my, oh th this is, sorry, this is argument of this. So we're going to minimize this to get the, the, um, the policy. And it's a quadratic function of um, x and u. Quadratic function of x, quadratic function of u, and this interaction term. All right, so we minimize this with respect to um, x, with respect to u of p minus 1. And what do I get? I get, um, I get the squared term in u, which is, 2 times um, Cx plus B transpose Tp times B plus L times U of P minus 1. So what I'm doing is I'm finding derivative of this with respect to du of P minus 1 plus 2 times B transpose T of P A x of p minus 1, set it equal to 0, yep. So then I get u of p minus 1 is equal to minus cx plus b transpose t of p b plus l minus 1 times b transpose t of p a times x of p minus 1. And this is called my gain, g at time point p minus 1. OK? And my problem is that I don't know x. All I have is x hat. So I found for my time point p minus 1 my policy. And here it is. And let's look at it for a second. It depends on L, which is the motor cost. Obviously, the greater your motor cost, the smaller, uh, the smaller U you're going to produce. And it depends on CX. What is CX? CX is the noise, the, the signal-dependent noise on the, on the U's. Bigger the noise is, the smaller your gain going to be. So that kind of makes sense. Yeah? So in the, um, the equation for pi star yeah. at time, At this point, um, I'm just finding the policy, right? So I'm saying at, at time point xp, show me what's your best policy. And that's the one that minimizes this, right? And so because, because my v of 
my value function at pi st I, I, for xp is is just you know it's just x. There is no x hat here. Yeah, I guess I'm just confused about the like the sneak of x hat. Yeah, it's going now. It's gonna now it's gonna make a difference. So because for time point p it didn't make a difference, but time point p one is gonna make a difference because at time point p g was zero, so it didn't matter. So the value function didn't depend on x hat. It just depended on x. But the value function under the optimum policy for p minus 1 is going to depend on x hat, because u depends on x hat. And time point p, u, didn't, u, u was just 0, so it didn't matter. OK, so, so then, right, so the important thing is u is equal to minus g of p minus 1 times x hat of p minus 1. All right, so now we have to put this back to this function. All right, so now you're going to get g times x hat, g times x hat, g times x hat. So your value function no longer is going to be quadratic in x. It's going to have x hats in it. That's the problem we face. But wait, didn't we just decide to replace all the x's with the x hats anyway? Like no, not thing? well, no, because remember, we can't, we're not going to replace this with, with x hat. We're only going to replace this with x hat. U depends on x hat. X doesn't depend on x hat. The actual state is independent of what our estimate is. So how can we compute that if we don't know the actual state? It doesn't matter. What we can still compute is the value function for any x and any x hat. So whatever the true state is, we can find the value function for x and x hat. You'll see. Okay. Okay. You'll see. So it's a function of Yes, and, and x hat. It's a function of both. Yeah. yeah. We'll see that this value function, so, so, so the value under the optimum policy is this quantity where u is equal to minus g times x hat, right? So all I can do right now is to say v under the optimum policy um, for uh, x of p minus 1 and x hat of p minus 1 is equal to x of p minus 1 transpose times this, which I'm, call it, I'm going to call it w of p minus 1 x times x of p minus 1 plus this u, which is going to be this term here. It's going to be x hat of p minus 1 transpose times g p minus 1 transpose times Um, minus, because this u is not going to have minus g times uh, x hat, minus 2 times um, x hat of p uh, minus 1 transpose g of p minus 1 transpose b t t p a x of p minus 1 plus the trace of t of p q x. So we have some strangeness going on here. So we have x, we have x hat, and we have x hat times x. We can do a little bit of simplification. Um, so what is g? Let's look at g. g is this quantity inverse times this, right? So that's exactly this quantity, right? So this quantity times g is it's going to cancel. So this term here is going to be plus x hat of p minus 1 transpose g of p minus 1 transpose. This times g, this is going to fall out. This is going to remain. bt t 
t of p a times x hat of p minus 1. So this term becomes this. Okay, so that's, that's kind of nice because here's what we got. We have, if I call this z, you see that it appears here as well. Right? So I have x hat transpose z x hat minus 2 x hat transpose z x. Well, that's kind of nice. Why is that nice? Because x hat transpose zx, that's the first term, minus 2 times x hat zx, that's the second term, right? That's going to be something that I can simplify. That's x minus x hat transpose z x minus x hat um, minus x hat zx. Sorry, x, x transpose zx. So this value function can be written as a quadratic function of x, which is what we've always done, plus a new term here, which I'm going to call error in estimating x. How far is the true x away from my estimate of x? So the value function under the optimum policy at time point x of p minus 1. It's going to depend on both x and x hat. And it's going to be x of p minus 1 transpose times E of p minus 1 plus a transpose t of p a x of p minus 1 plus Yeah, so the last term just gets into here.
So what we see is that the value function becomes a quadratic function of x and the error in estimating x. And basically, this matrix we're going to call Wx at time point um, p minus 1. And this matrix we're going to call We at time point p minus 1. So it's a quadratic function. So in 2005, Todorov, his work was based on showing that if you have signal-dependent noise in the state update equation, like we have now, and if you incorporate that into the Bellman equation, then what you end up with is a representation of the value function that is quadratic equation, but in terms of x and the error in estimation of x. So remember how we proceeded last time. What we said is that if we can write the value function in terms of a quadratic equation, then when we apply the, um, the optimum commands and you know, we see that the value function is quadratic, the next step is going to be just a formula that basically says if we apply this, we're still going to get a quadratic function on the next trial. So um, the, the proof in, in basically in your, in your book and in what Todorov did in 2005 was to show that for whatever k that you have, whatever time point k that you have, I'll basically write it down for you. So um, if you have uh, If you have a time point k, let's say time point k plus 1. You have the value function under the optimum policy at x of k plus 1 and x hat of k plus 1 equal to um, x of k plus 1 wx of k plus 1 transpose um, x of k plus 1 plus e of k plus 1 transpose um, we k plus 1 e of k plus 1 plus a constant. So if that's the value function, and if you were to apply u equal to um, uh, at time point k, you apply u equal to minus g of k times x hat of k, then what happens is that the value function at time point k and x hat of k is going to be equal to uh, once again at quadratic function of x. And the error. So any time point, if you begin, you can write the value function under the optimum policy as a quadratic function of x and error in estimation of x. For the next time point, you can find a minimum of the sum of the alpha plus the value function, and it's going to be a linear function of x hat. And when you apply that policy, the value function associated with that policy is again going to be a quadratic function of x and the error. 
So that's just like before, except now, instead of having a value function that only depends on x, we also have a value function that depends on the error in estimating, um, uh, estimating this. Now, um, yeah, so that, that's basically it. We don't really have any anything, I think, other than uh, the idea that uh, the value function being a function of x and um, an x hat. Now, um, x hat, of course, depends on k, right? The, the common gain. So technically, this becomes a problem. Because remember that what happens is that when you do estimation, you go forward in time. You say, I have computed all the common gains I need from beginning to the end. Right, because you can do that. You can say, at my first time point, this is going to be my first common gain. My second my time point is going to be my second, and so forth. In, in this approach, the k's are going to influence these e's, which are going to become part of the value function. So what, what Todorov showed is that k's and the value function, they converge after a few iterations. So you run this forward in time, you get the k's, you get the value function backwards in time, and then you run it again, and you run it again, and the two, the two converge. And um, I did it in your book for a, uh, uh, the condition where you're moving the eye and the head just to check to see, and it, and it works quite well. It converges after four or five um, runs through the, uh, through the system. Question? How is it possible to run the Bellman equation going backwards in time when you need Cx, which is dependent on the x state, which is running forwards in time? So Cx depends on the noise. But if you have like state dependent, like you said that that's signal dependent, right? In x. Yes. So that means that like you need to know where x is in order to compute Cx, which means you have to run forward iteration of the model to compute x's to get cx so that you can run backwards iteration of the De Bellman equation. Like it seems like that doesn't, that seems weird. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. Um, because, because until you get to that state, you don't know what the feedback gain is going to be. Right, so the feedback gain is going to depend on not just x hat, but the value of the so it's won't, it, it would be a, the noises are going to influence the size of the feedback gain because that's going to affect c. So this is this is what affects so c x is the size of u, and then we're going to have a, a, a variable that, that also depends on the the size of x, which is going to depend on d, um, which which. Uh, Let's see, where, where is this in our equation? Um, it's going to depend on, it's going to influence k, the, 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 uh, the common gain. And, and then that's indirectly going to influence e that you have there. So, so it's, it's an excellent point. Basically, you, you can see that uh, the optimum u, so let's see, what is, where did we do g? Um, there it is, all right? So you see that g depends on cx, right? But cx depends on u. Right, this, this quantity here is ci, right? And, um, the variance of it depends on the size of the size of the noise. So, so just just to be clear, it, it, it isn't the actual value of u that matters. What matters is how the noise grows with u. So c doesn't depend on u, oh, okay. right? It just depends on it, it's just the slope of that line. Is it, it's not circular. All right.
this is where we are with the Bellman equation and signal dependent noise. And as f as that's as far as control theory, as far as uh, uh, optimal control and signal dependent noise has gone. And it's, like I said, it's about now nine years old, this, this derivation. How does that representation of the, because like really the all noise. you need is when you're trying to compute like optimal view is yeah. the gains. Yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. With common estimation, and that's all that will just give you the process. So, how does this representation of the value function in terms of the error right. actually help in terms of like, like the control theory of what's going on? Because you never have access to the actual underlying x. So right. it seems like it's kind of a little bit of a. So, so it, it's important because when we put u into the uh, into this equation, when we say. When we say the value of the policy is going to be the, the, the cost per step plus the expected value of this, well, this depends on u, but u depends on x hat, right? So this expected value, which is what we just did, we found was to be a quadratic function of x and e. So th the importance of this is that it shows us that no matter what step we're at, if we have the value function associated with the optimal policy and we minimize the Bellman equation, we end up with another value function that still is quadratic. And so what this means is that in your, in your recipe, you're going to see that Wx of k depends on this. It's just going to be some you know, transformation of Wx. We is going to be some transformation of k. And g is going to be the function that depends on Wx and We. Okay, so basically it just, the fact that that transforms quadratic value functions into quadratic value yeah. functions iteratively allows you to have that same linear form for yeah. the policy on Yeah, theory. yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So before, when we didn't have um, x hat, th th all that we had was on the left side. We just had this. Right. And so when we did the policy that was optimum, we still got a value function that was quadratic in x. So the thing was, it just consistent with itself. The only thing that was new today was that, well, my u depends on x hat, not depends on x. But to handle that, we have to introduce this concept of an error in state. And as long as we do that, we get a value function that's quadratic in error in state.